Uh, nice to meet you all. I know some of you, I don't know uh, all of you. My name's David Sweet. I'm a neonatologist from Belfast. I was very grateful whenever Elaine and the Surfon team invited me to come along as a co-investigator. And I, I, like Elaine, believe this is a very important uh, clinical question that, that uh, hasn't yet been addressed. And for today's meeting, I was asked to go through the evidence for surfactant use in late preterm infants. And um, I could get that over with in about two seconds by saying there's no evidence. But what, what I'll do is I'll try and describe where we are with surfactant guidelines and, and, and try and explain uh, by showing you some of the European consensus guidelines uh, you know, we're thinking is at, at the moment with, with using surfactant in these slightly more mature babies. So hopefully over the next half an hour or so, we'll go through uh, some of the current controversies in RDS care. I'll share the most recent European uh, RDS guideline recommendations from last year's fifth update of the European guidelines. And then we'll have some discussion related to gestational age when implementing surfactant guidelines. So uh, for the last... Um, 15 years or so, I've been a member of the European RDS Guidelines Consensus Group. So, so every three years, there's a group of neonatologists from around Europe who are brought together from different European countries, from different perspectives, who are asked to look at all of the evidence from randomized controlled trials and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials to try and make sensible recommendations for how we should manage babies with RDS. <coughs> Uh, the, the guidelines uh, process has been endorsed by the European Association of Perinatal Medicine and the European Society for Pediatric Research. The group was first convened in 2005, the guidelines first published in 2007, and then they've been updated every three years since that. So if, you, if you're interested in looking at the guidelines, you can view them open access uh, in the anatology. And just to summarize the guidelines, and most of this stuff is what you know if you work in neonatal units. We know that uh, if a baby has RDS, we should treat them with surfactant. And there's good evidence that natural surfactants are better than uh, synthetic surfactants. And we don't have synthetic surfactants available any longer because of this. And the current thinking is that we should have a policy of early rescue surfactant as standard. But there are occasions when surfactant should be administered in the delivery suite such as those babies that require intubation for stabilization. So the European group are trying to make clinicians not do routine intubation for prophylactic surfactant, but rather try and initiate stabilization with CPAP. And the grade of evidence for that is strong A and a strong recommendation. And the European group believe that we should give surfactant early in the course of the disease. And a suggested protocol is to treat babies who are worsening when the FiO2 goes above 30% on CPAP pressure of more than six centimeters of water. And you can see there's a little bit of, that's not as strong evidence, it's grade B evidence, and I'll take you through where that evidence comes from and the trials that it comes from, which don't include any babies that are above 34 weeks gestation. And the strength of recommendation for that is not as certain, it's, it's two. And they believe that we should use poractant alpha in an initial dose of 200 per kilo rather than 100 per kilo if we're, giving, if we're using Curaserf as, as rescue therapy. And for the typical babies that we're treating with RDS, the most recent guideline is saying that LISA is the preferred mode of surfactant administration for babies on CPAP, provided clinicians are experienced with this technique. So it's not grade A evidence and it's not a strong recommendation, but it seems to be evolving that, that trying to avoid any mechanical ventilation for small babies is, is, is helpful. And if babies have ongoing RDS after a first dose of surfactant, we should go ahead and give a second and sometimes even a third dose of surfactant if there's persistent requirement for ventilation or persistent oxygen requirements. So I don't think there's anything new there. That's kind of what I think most people in the UK are currently doing. But does this hold true for babies 34 to 38 weeks gestation? I think we have to think about why we're making those recommendations and what we're trying to prevent by not intubating for surfactant, etc. And try and think about whether for a bigger baby, whether the same kind of rules would apply. So starting with the first two then on the timing of surfactant. 
Um, we've said a policy of early rescue should be what we use and suggesting that we should do this early rescue when babies are in more than 30 uh, percent oxygen on CPAP and that I guess is what in this uh, uh, SURFON trial is going to be the kind of recommended intervention group. So why do we say that in the European group? Well it's because there's been randomized controlled trials which have compared planned routine prophylactic intubation for surfactant administration versus initiation of stabilization on CPAP and then rescuing with surfactant when, when certain criteria are met such as increasing oxygen. And if you put those studies all together in, in meta-analysis in Cochrane, and this was done in 2012, you can see the forest plot lies to the right of unity favoring control. So at present, we can say that prophylactically intubating and giving surfactant to all babies increases the risk of death or BPD. So we should be planning initiation of CPAP uh, for stabilization. But big babies don't get BPD. So how relevant is this for the 34 to 38 week gestation babies. If you go back to the early studies in surfactant, in the, uh, when surfactant first came along as a treatment, there were studies comparing intervention with surfactant earlier in the course of RDS compared to later in the course of RDS. So some of these trials were randomizing babies when they were in about 30% oxygen compared to leaving them until they got sicker into about 60% oxygen. And again, there's been a Cochrane review, um, most recent update, 2012, comparing these early versus late uh, surfactant treatment. And you can see the forest plot lies to the left of the line of unity favoring early. So um, from this, we can say that if surfactant is required, then the earlier it is given, the better the outcome. But the outcome in this case is death or BPD. And big babies don't get BPD. So is this relevant for the 34 to 38 week gestation group? If you look at what populations are being studied in those Cochrane reviews, um, I've picked the three studies that we got in the, in the um, meta-analysis that I've just shown you. The OSARIS trial in 1992 studied 2,690 babies who are judged to be at high risk of RDS. They didn't specify gestation in that study, but the vast majority of the babies in that study were preterm and they had 16% lower rates of death or BPD with earlier treatment. In the uh, Gortner study, which was in the meta-analysis, babies were randomized between 27 and 32 weeks gestation, and they showed uh, um, they, uh, not much difference in death or BPD. And in Plavka 2002, they randomized babies less than 30 weeks gestation to getting their surfactant before initiation of high frequency oscillation ventilation versus high frequency oscillation ventilation and then surfactant. And the rate of death or BPD was less in the babies who got the surfactant earlier. So this is the data that we're using now to make these current recommendations for deciding that 30% oxygen is about where we want to treat. But you can see it's old data and it's probably more relevant for the babies that have been studied, the less than 32 week population, and maybe not just as relevant for the babies that are slightly more mature. There are other advantages of early surfactant treatment for preterm babies in these meta-analysis. There is reduced mortality, there's reduced risk of pneumothoraces, there's reduced risk of PIE. And just to show you the meta-analysis, there's mortality lying to the left of uh, the line of unity. There is pneumothorax lying to the left of the line of unity. And there is PIE. Now, how many of you have ever seen a term baby with PIE? Very infrequent, I would, I'd imagine almost never. How many term babies or near-term babies die from respiratory distress? Very few. So are these findings relevant to this population that we're studying in surf on? So near-term babies don't get BPD. They don't get PIE. There's not likely to be much an effect on mortality if you go slightly earlier compared to slightly later. And I would argue that pneumothorax is probably just as likely to be caused by attempts at surfactant administration than by lack of surfactant. So I think there's a genuine question here. Does, does um, getting in with surfactant early in a bigger baby improve or disimprove the rate of pneumothoraces. Uh, some people argue just leave them alone and some people say you should be getting in there with surfactant and I don't think we know the answer to that. 
And then the European guidelines, this is this big emphasis on this 30%. And that, that's what they've picked as their, it's time to go when the baby's in more than 30% oxygen. And the reason for that is because of those early trials that were done compared 30% to about 60%. But then more recently in the, in the build up to the Optimus trial, Peter Dargaville looked at babies in his unit in Hobart in Australia. And he took a cohort of nearly 300 babies less than 32 weeks who were, they were trying not to intervene with surfactant. They initiated CPAP. And he was able to show that as their oxygen levels increased, you could kind of predict which babies were going to fail on CPAP by the level of oxygen within the first few hours after birth. And he had the under 32 weekers divided into two groups, less than 28 weeks, and then the 29 to 32 weeks. And the smallest babies, they failed when their FiO2 went above 30% at about two hours of age. And the bigger babies failed when they went above 30% uh, oxygen by about six hours of age. So he used the same sort of cutoff. Uh, by, and he, the reason he used that cutoff was because he tried different cutoffs uh, and using this receiver operator characteristic curve, looking at the sensitivity and specificity of just using FiO2, he was able to show that about 30% was the kind of best cutoff for deciding which babies were going to fail and which were going to be able to stay on CPAP. So that's where the European RDS guideline have come up with this figure of 30% for the, for the smaller babies. But is this true or does this, is this still relevant for babies 34 to 38 weeks gestation? And, and I would argue that we just don't know. So then the other bit of the European guideline we should, um, uh, I was going to show you, sorry, how the, how the RDS guideline has evolved over the years with this kind of lack of evidence and how they've managed to fudge the issue. So the first version of the guideline, they said early rescue surfactant should be given to untreated babies if there's evidence of RDS, such as increasing the requirement for oxygen. That doesn't say very much. It just says use, surf, use surfactant if you think the baby's got RDS. And then they said individual units need to develop protocols for when to intervene as RDS progresses, because they acknowledged that nobody knew at that stage what the best cutoff was. So the grade of evidence was D. In 2010, they said the same thing, more or less. But they said you might factor in whether the mums had prenatal steroids or not in terms of your decision making. But there was no evidence to make a specific recommendation. So they, they, they said, you work, out, work it out yourself in your own unit what you want to do. By 2013, we had the Dargaville paper and the, the Cochrane uh, meta-analysis of early versus late. And it was the, people were kind of saying, we should really, you're a group of experts, you should make some recommendations. So that's in 2013 when they first came up with a cutoff of 30% for the smaller babies and maybe allowing the bigger babies to get a little bit sicker before intervening with surfactant. Not particularly evidence-based, more expert opinion, but they graded that as grade of evidence B and strength of recommendation 2. And the most recent guideline has just used the one cutoff of 30% uh, on CPAP pressure of at least 6 centimeters of water. And it's kind of inferred that this is for the population of babies that are less than 32 weeks gestation, because the reference that they've used to make this recommendation is the Dargaville data. So there's no real strong evidence to support any particular cutoff point for babies born 34 to 38 weeks gestation. So what about these babies of more than 34 weeks gestation? No matter what you do to them, I don't think you're going to cause BPD. They're not at particularly high risk of dying. There's variable pathology causing respiratory distress. Sometimes it's RDS, sometimes it's TTN stroke RDS. There's some pneumonia in there. Some babies are developing PPHN. If we have to give surfactant to them, the dose will be quite large compared to what we use and therefore relatively more expensive. Some people believe that you're better to leave these babies alone because they don't like being handled. If they're quite happy on CPAP, it doesn't matter what their FiO2 is. And then you've got to think, what is the added value of giving surfactant? So Elaine's already uh, talked you through a little bit about the late preterm population from one of her the same paper, I think you can see that what's the burden of this respiratory disease in this population, 34 to 36 weeks, greater than 37 weeks. You can see many babies, uh, about 1 in 20 of them, do end up on mechanical ventilation. And about 
maybe nearly one in 10 end up on ventilation or non-invasive respiratory support. So there is a problem that we have in our units every day and, and, and it's trying to work out how best to manage this problem uh, whenever there's an absence of evidence for how best to do it. Many clinicians do set the threshold for surfactant higher in bigger babies. There's a belief that these babies are stronger and they can grunt through it, and that's often right. There's no real concerns that by allowing them to grunt through it that you're going to be increasing the mortality because if they get worse, you can intervene with surfactant at any stage. Some people believe that if you start annoying them by putting laryngoscopes in and things like that, that you might tip them over and make them worse. And then there's people that argue if you're trying to use treatments, you should be trying to be cost effective. So getting in with surfactant is, is, is an expensive treatment and it may not be necessary. So it's balancing all those things. What happens in the USA? It's pretty similar to Europe. We've got the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines for surfactant replacement therapy. They've more or less mirrored the European guideline when it's in terms of treating the preterm infants. And they've acknowledged that the surfactant trials are mostly in babies less than 34 weeks. And they suggest that we should use surfactant in these babies if they get RDS. And then for the more mature babies, they've just talked of sort of a, about a surfactant inactivation and secondary surfactant dysfunction in other conditions like meconium aspiration, PPHN, pneumonia, etc. And the uh, recommendations that they've made are strong for using surfactant in the preterm population and weaker for using surfactant in these more mature infants, um, but they haven't been very specific about when you should intervene with surfactant. So just for yourselves, I don't know, I don't want you to look at your slides that, that you've got for the answers, but how to think yourself. What do you think the pros and cons of getting in early with surfactant might be? I mean, Elaine's touched on it already, and I've told you that I don't believe that we're protecting babies against BPD by getting in with early surfactant. So what might be a reason for going ahead early? Any, anybody want to give me a suggestion for why surfactant might be good to get in early when the babies are less sick? Go ahead. Yeah, so they're, they're, you get in, you get them sorted, you get them out the door more quickly. Okay, any other suggestion? Okay, so the parents are really stressed already and if you get them better quickly, there's less kind of overall hassle for everybody. If you've got a baby who's grunting along for several days, it might, might be better all round if the baby's not as sick and not, doesn't allow to be, be, become as sick. Anything else? You might save a transfer out if you've got a unit that has to step up if they're going to be worsening above a certain threshold. Yep. Yeah, you might reduce that maternal infant separation and the, the implications potentially on breastfeeding, as Elaine uh, mentioned earlier. And what are the cons then? Cost. So it's maybe going to be expensive and you don't know what the benefit for that expense is if you treat more babies. Anything, any other con? Yeah, so hassling the baby and hurting him and doing a laryngoscopy and chasing him around the bed you know, because he's strong and you can't get the tube in. Burden of transfer, definite transfer. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So you, you, if you, I mean, if you decide you have to move a baby to get the treatment, you mean? No, for intubation. So there are some units where if they're intubated, they have to move to it. Right. Okay. So that you know, that's another one. That they can continue to be monitored. Yeah. And they are with their parents. Yep. Good. So 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 hopefully, I mean, in this room, hopefully you're here for the surf one trial. Hopefully you'll all agree that there are pros and cons and we don't know the answer. Um, so I just put some of my thoughts down which echo some of your thoughts. So babies might get better more quickly which will be less expensive if they get home more quickly which will offset the cost of surfactant. You may reduce pneumothoraces, you may improve bonding, breastfeeding, may reduce the need for escalation of care or mechanical ventilation. And then the cons is it's costly to give surfactant handling you may tip them over and make them worse. There's no evidence of benefit, I guess, at the moment, 
and then we're exposing babies to mechanical ventilation for whatever harms that that may cause in terms of increased risk of wheezing, etc. And I would argue that nobody really knows what's best. And I don't think anybody who thinks they know what's best is, you know, can, can be really truthful about that in terms of the evidence base for how they, what they believe. So there are two approaches if you don't know the answer. One is you can continue to do what you like as there's no wrong answer. Or you can try and help answer the question. And I guess everybody who's here is trying to help answer the question. And the surf one study will explore what is currently the recommendation from the European RDS guideline, albeit for less uh, mature babies, as the sort of intervention group versus expectant care, which is just allowing the baby to become worse and hoping that they're going to get better on their own and grunt through it. And I think um, there's no, spe no specified time where it's suggested that you should treat with surfactant and surfon. It's just where you start to lose your nerve. But we hope that people don't lose their nerve, at least until the baby's met the failure criteria for what's been defined as severe respiratory failure in surfon. So you, know, you don't have to get in when the baby's in more than 45% oxygen if you're quite comfortable that they look OK. And then that the study will look at the only outcome that you really can look at in these mature babies is going to be the duration of, uh, the, uh, of the length of stay, because you can't do mortality or BPD, because those aren't really relevant outcomes for this population. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>